Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided. This threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy and other Egan Community Television programming is supported by Thomson Reuters, makers of Westlaw Next and based in Egan. Through Westlaw Next and other innovative online services, Thomson Reuters is the world's leading source of intelligent information for businesses and professionals. Online at ThomsonReuters.com and by U.S. Federal Credit Union the member-owned financial institution offering service, value, and experience you can trust to the greater Twin Cities community. Welcome to this edition of Access to Democracy. I'm your host today, Steve Francisco, and it's a real treat to welcome back to Access to Democracy a return visitor today, State Representative Sandy Mason. Hello, Steve. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Good to have you on the show today. Sandy, you've had a long career in public office, as I understand it. Uh, before I lived in Egan, we were discussing before the show, you actually have served. Well, tell us your background. What oh. have you done in public office? Uh, well, a number of things. But I originally started because I was on the Egan Park Commission. When we moved to Egan, there weren't very many parks here, and I had kids that needed uh, places to play. So I got mm -hmm. involved with the Park Commission and from there uh, I did run for City Council and I served on the City Council for eight years and we did a lot of building during that time as a matter of fact. We, mm -hmm. That's when we added to the uh, City Hall, we did the ice arena and so it was, it was a pretty busy time. I also uh, was on a number of committees regarding this with the sc school and probably uh, where when we're going to get into this is I have a real deep passion for transportation mm -hmm. and that is because when I was on the City Council I was the liaison to the Minnesota Valley Transit Authority and once I started getting into that it got into a just a major uh, commitment to transportation. Right. And you had previously served two terms in the State House. Right. And then there was a break in between mm -hmm. when uh, after the 2010 election and then in November 2012 you won your House seat back again but with a new number we're now District 51. You represent District 51A. Exactly. Which covers? Basically it is most of you and that is west of 35E all of northern Burnsville, so everything above Highway 13 all the way to Savage is 51A, and then there's a few precincts along uh, County Road 11 and 77 as well. Mm -hmm. I was very interested to discover something about you that I didn't know until a couple of hours ago. I hope this information is okay. okay. correct. Okay, what? I found this very interesting that you grew up in Ohio, mm -hmm. you graduated from Valparaiso University in Indiana, uh -huh. and then came to Minnesota. But one of the things you did previously, you worked for the Minnesota Historical Society, and yep. for nine years you served as a tour guide in the Minnesota State Capitol? Exactly. I, the things you learn on the show are very <laughs> interesting. I never knew that. And so how did it, did you have thoughts when you were a tour guide, you looked in the House chamber and said, someday I'm going to have a seat as a legislator here, or? Actually, yeah, probably I did. I mean, it was an, it's an exciting place to be because people from all over the world come there. And actually, when I took the, uh, fr the reason I got into this, I knew a friend that was working there at the time who actually is an Egan resident as well. And then when there was an opening, I applied, and at that time I my third child was uh, fairly young and I just wanted part-time employment and I'm thinking okay I'll do this for two years yeah. but I stayed there for about nine years just because it's an incredible place to be and also while I was there we were also developing some of the programs so, uh, so uh, some of the uh, school programs that used to be under the house uh, mm -hmm. information office were transferred to us so we got to put together various tours mm -hmm. for school districts for you know for a number of things sounds that like was you exciting. En enjoyed the experience it, but, I did but I, I find that interesting that a 
legislator used to give tours of the Capitol. Capitol. Yes. Very interesting. Let's jump into it, Sandy. Okay. We have a lot of ground to cover in a short time. Um, it's no surprise to any of our viewers, Minnesota in recent years has lurched from budget crisis to budget crisis, persistent shortfalls, cuts in government programs, everything from health care to affordable housing to education, uh, the infamous school shift where we basically took two billion dollars that was owed to Minnesota public mm -hmm. schools. Some of that money has been repaid. We're going to talk about that further. Um, the big news in taxes was a new top tier rate uh, for individuals earning 150000 or more or couples earning 250000 or more. New top rate, 9.85%. Um, how will this new tax bill put Minnesota on a more solid financial footing? Well, I think yeah, what you're talking about is what we hope this, our, what we did this year, uh, will accomplish because there have been so many cuts, so many changes, and this top tier, um, actually th many people are paying less taxes now than they were many years ago, even though there, many of our opponents are trying to say differently. But this provides a little bit more fairness because the top tier was actually paying less percentage-wise than the rest of the population. And we do need new revenue regardless. I mean, we are a growing state, thank goodness. Uh, and there's a lot, but we have so many, so many needs. And transportation among those things that we have just been, has not had the support over the years that we need to, that, we sh that should have been there. So we have a lot of catch up to do. We had, uh, and in addition to providing the stability for all of the uh, many cuts that have mm -hmm. made for the past decade. Some of the Republicans have suggested that this new top tier rate, which closes this gap in terms of progressivity of our income tax structure, they've suggested that this is terrible for Minnesota, that uh, I believe it was the Republican Senate leader said this session will be known as the tax, tax, tax session, and that really there was no reform there that occurred. Um, they say it's going to kill jobs and cause wealthy Minnesotans to flee the state. Okay. What do you think of that? I think he's wrong, and I think we needed to do something. Uh, and actually, when I was talking to somebody who told me he normally votes Republicans, I said, okay, what do you think we did right? And he said, at least you got something done. So bottom, the main things that I think we did this, uh, this session is we came in, we knew what our priorities were, we took care of those priorities, and we finished on time. Mm -hmm. And we took a lot of tough votes. This is probably the most intense session I have served in. And, and while we took tough votes, at least I felt many times we're making progress. It's something that needed to be done to help Minnesota, whereas in the other two sessions, it was between just perfectly awful and absolutely terrible. Right. And we did nothing to move the state forward or to help the state in general. One of the issues on taxes is too is that a lot of people in Minnesota saw their property taxes go up. That even though people in the legislature and previously Governor Pawlenty could say, well, we held the line on taxes, property, property taxes were going up, up, and up for a lot of people. It wasn't for, there some relief for property tax? There uh, absolutely was. And, that and was, for I, renters too? Exactly. There was a renter's credit and that, that is huge. Uh, during the last session, they did take away the property tax uh, refund, which was, that was huge. I mean, we've had that for many, many years to try to even out for people that aren't able to pay mm -hmm. or that need the extra help. And so this year we did come back and we did a number of things. One is we invested big time in schools and that's where most of the people are when they're talking about their property taxes increasing. It's because the, the needs that the school districts have. Mm -hmm. So hopefully uh, we still have work to go but I think we did an incredible job this year in the amount we put in into the school districts. We also did with, uh, something with LGA trying to provide local government assistance, assistance. Exactly. which Egan doesn't receive as no. I understand because we're a more affluent community but a lot of communities in Minnesota especially in greater Minnesota they rely on those LGA that help from right. the state to pay for police firefighting right basic services well as long as we're talking about education that's a good segue uh, my information is that the schools are going to get an additional 485 million dollars this year 
uh, and the big news is an increase in the per pupil state funding formula which determines how much school districts get exactly. uh, and we're going to have new all day kindergarten talk exactly. about that for a moment that to me is you know there were two things that i think we needed to look at because we're in a global economy and we know that other other states and other well I won't even go with the case. They're making the investments, the, the, right? And other countries in particular. So we we still have so, uh, some catch-up to do. But uh, while there is a lot of data that shows the early childhood uh, pays off in big dividends, like 12 to $16 uh, per, for every dollar spent. But we did do the all-day kindergarten. We did put in 40, I think it was $40 million to provide scholarships for the early childhood. So this is a huge uh, mm -hmm. move forward, and and I know, actually, before it must have been a few days before the bill was passed, I was uh, getting my nails done, and this woman has two kids. One is in kindergarten right now, and another one coming up. And so I asked her, okay, would you know, what do you think about the legislature? And she said, you know, all day kindergarten would be great. And she's uh, very excited about yes, that. Yes, there's a number of people that are very excited mm -hmm. about that. One thing that didn't happen in education, there was an effort in the legislature this session to pass an anti-bullying bill, which would have uh, created some new reporting requirements for school districts, training, and other requirements to reduce the incidence of students being bullied right. for any variety of reasons. We all know there was a famous case up in the Anoka Hennepin School District where there was a lawsuit. The district ended up having to pay a lot of money. Are you disappointed that the legislature was not able to pass anti-bullying legislation this year? Absolutely. And the main reason was the fact that there is, it will entail a certain amount of funding to get all the training done. And mm -hmm. they're just, at this point, the, you know, when we pass it, they're just that's something. Money. This is something that's likely to be back on the agenda I, I in 2014. I, I would think so, mm -hmm. absolutely. The House also failed to get a special tax to finance paying back the schools. We talked just a few moments ago about the school funding shift. Um, right now, originally the amount was around two billion. My understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, it's about 850, 850 million right now from previous borrowing. Um, however, the budget surpluses will be applied more quickly and directly to paying back the schools. So the school districts that cover Egan and Burnsville uh, uh, were starting to move in the right direction on paying back that school funding shift. And actually, uh, if you looked at the revenue uh, report that came out in the last few days, there is going to be it's over like 400 million mm. and most of that will be going so the revenues are coming, coming in, in better than expected yes, which accelerates paying back the shift exactly and yeah. then plus you know what we did in the legislation is we will pay it back sooner usually you would wait till the end of the year but this time i think as they get the figures together i think by the end of september the schools will be good getting news this money. and the good news isn't just for students in k through 12 either there was some good news for higher education tell us about oh. that for and students at Minsku and the University of Minnesota regarding tuition, what did you do? Right, and again, we were uh, giving money to those institutions, but the deal is they can't, the uh, tuition is frozen for the next two years. A hard freeze for two years. Absolutely. Right. And, and I know that uh, Jean Pulowski, who is chair of the higher ed, is going to be looking very, very closely over some of the comments that have been made over how the U of M is spending money. So mm -hmm. if there's, you're going to be seeing probably a lot more accountability over mm -hmm. the next few years. Mm -hmm. Let's shift our focus, if we could, Sandy, to health care. Uh, the legislature, one of the most important things you did was to pass legislation this year creating a new state health insurance exchange. Mm -hmm. Minnesota's program is going to be called MinSure, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to be up and running October 1st but health insurance companies still have to go through an application and approval process before right. they can offer policies for sale on the new exchange. Right. This is all part of the new Affordable Care Act, what some people have called Obamacare. Will MNsure be ready by October 1st? I know that they will be doing everything that they can to make sure that they meet those commitments. And at this point, uh, I'm just, you know, holding my, holding my, crossing mm -hmm. my fingers 
but I know that there's, you know, there's a lot of effort to make sure that we can comply. And it's important to get this right because a lot of Minnesotans who they may not qualify for medical assistance, but they need to have a place where they can go to buy individual insurance, especially because of the individual mandate in the right. law. Yeah, right. right. Uh, the administration, as we know, recently gave a reprieve to businesses. However, the individual mandate's still there. There are a lot of complicated issues dealing with this, but it's really important to have this ex exchange succeed, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, my thought is at least if Minnesota, and Minnesota is a leader in all of this, and I know that some of our uh, leaders went, when they were actually working on the Affordable Care Act as well, were involved in the uh, Washington discussions. Mm -hmm. But it, Healthcare reform is absolutely necessary, and uh, is it? I know that the ACA is not going to solve all our problems. Right. And so we still have a lot of work to do, but at least I'm hoping with with what we're doing in Minnesota and one of the other things, like I've signed on to Single Payer Act, just because I think that there are some major holes that need to be taken care of, and this would deal with some of those. So that's mm -hmm. why I'm. We need to be moving. Everything helps, but mm -hmm. nothing, we haven't done anything to totally right. solve the problem. So we're just making things better. And as I've mentioned in interviewing previous guests on this show, uh, including your colleague Lori Halverson, that, you know, no law that Congress ever passed was perfect. I'm sure you'd agree no law that I, the Minnesota legislature passes is it's perfect, even though people have the best of intentions. And so when you find out that something isn't working, exactly the way that you hoped it would, uh, it's more logical to say, let's go back and fix it, right? Exactly. Rather than say, well, let's throw it out. It's a failure. Let's get rid of it. And that's it. And it, when you're talking about making laws, it's a compromise. And I'll just stay with the yeah. state. I mean, yeah. the people that have impact on a law are the governor, it's the Senate, and the House. And right now, we're very fortunate that all three are uh, DF, controlled by the DFL, but it doesn't mean that each body has the same visions or right. the same right. attitudes about things. So everything that we're doing is a compromise. So, yeah, if uh, I certainly didn't get everything that I wanted, but I thought... But you'll be back next right. year. That's to it, come yeah, for right, another bite right. at the apple. Exactly. Yeah. As it, you need to compromise. I mean, that is the bigger issue. I think up to this point, it's apparent a lot got done in this session. Some I people so. would say it was a very busy session. Some would actually say it was an historic session, uh, primarily because of one major piece of legislation. Last November, as you know, voters in Minnesota, they narrowly rejected an amendment to define marriage, mm -hmm. limiting it to just one man, one woman. The legislature passed a bill, Governor Dayton signed it, making Minnesota the 12th state to recognize marriage equality, allowing same-sex couples to get married. You supported that. Um, it seems there's still a lot of misinformation or misunderstanding out in the public about what this new law, which takes effect August 1st, what it does and doesn't do. Um, will churches now be required to marry same-sex couples in violation of their religious beliefs? No, and I think there was something added even on the floor that day. There was an amendment, but never was that the intent to tell churches what they had to do. And again, and, and that's why I think people really truly need to understand why what we did was important. We are not, everybody had, there are lots of religions and there but, are some people who have no religion and beliefs. that too right. and but technically the way our country is set up there's supposed to be a separation between church and states and so that to me was the reason we here what we were doing was we're providing a fairness or an equality that was the reason for passing mm -hmm. the bill it may not you know there are people that can object on religious grounds but that's not really the way our, our right. constitutions are set so up. So August 1st, nothing changes that same-sex marriage is legal, but we're talking about the institution of civil marriage, where the government legally recognizes a marriage and the legal rights that attach to that, right? We're exactly. not talking about telling the Catholic Church or any other church that they're going to have to start marrying same-sex couples. Exactly, and that's, and on the other hand, I know I had a minister telling me that you know, she was just looking for, and worked very hard for this because 
it was really difficult for her mm -hmm. not to be able to reform mar marriages when she was requested to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of the major uh, rallies that we had at the, the Capitol. We had a lot of rallies this yeah. year, hu and huge. I mean, uh, Some of the biggest in the Capitol's history, uh, as I recall. Uh, yes, yeah. And, but yeah, the one is in particular, all the clergy that were in support mm -hmm. of the marriage equality bill. I think that was overwhelming and so impressive. Mm -hmm. So, I think for, don't you think, Sandy, I've thought of this too, that a lot, for a lot of Minnesotans, we have family members, we have friends who are in same-sex relationships, and it came down to basic fairness that Minnesotans support the idea that some people shouldn't be denied the legal rights that other people enjoy. Exactly. What and we call equal protection of the law. Mm -hmm. And which the Supreme Court recently ruled on too, yeah. Which was also very, very, very significant. Good. But you know, when we were door door knocking, because typically this is not an issue that comes up a lot mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. my district, but because of the conversations that were happening because of the amendment last year, and then the pe going forward on this, there are so many families, so many people that had an opinion on this. Mm -hmm but they had never, you know, we, it was not something we ever really discussed before, but it was really getting di uh, discussed within the last year or two, and I, it was just amazing. An amazing conversation and historic event. Mm -hmm. Let's shift gears to transportation. Egan sits at a transportation crossroads. I know from the time you moved to Egan some 40 years ago, we didn't have 35E. We didn't have uh, all of the complicated uh, arteries and highways and light rail and everything else that surrounds us now. A lot fewer people living in Egan Absolutely. than there is now. So as far as transportation goes, there was a task force last fall that said that Minnesota needs to raise $50 billion for its transportation needs over the next 20 years. Uh, but during this past session, the legislature actually provided little new money for roads, bridges, bus, and rail transit, and the legislature specifically rejected raising gas taxes. Are you concerned about the state's ability to meet our future transportation needs in coming years? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we have been behind for years and years, and MnDOT, if you look at some of their uh, agendas, I mean, they have projects going 20, 30 mm -hmm. years out. I mean, and these are for projects that should be done right now. And I think the one I'll bring up is County Road 14, which mm -hmm. is over in the western portion of the state. And when I talk to legislators there or people, I mean, it's, they said almost any family that lives in that area knows somebody that has died on mm -hmm. that, free, on mm -hmm. that highway. And so, and this, this year, I mean, they've, they've always been coming to the uh, mm -hmm. Transportation Committee for hearings, and this year they were, did an outstanding job. And it's bipartisan, it's businesses, it's everybody. You know, they want they want something done. They will, and and I believe that when the governor was, I think, in St. Cloud, uh, he asked how pe you know people are willing to uh, mm -hmm. have ga raise the gas tax, and I was told four out of five people raised their hands. Yes. Eventually, we're going to have to do it, and you know, we haven't even mentioned the fact that what six, seven years after the collapse of the 35W bridge in Minneapolis, we still have lots of bridges in our state. Uh, that are insufficient, structurally insufficient, and are right. going to have to be repaired or replaced. Right, exactly. I mean, we are we are not keeping up, and it's 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 really difficult to sit on the committee. And, mm -hmm. I, and we have we have tremendous chairs. Ronnie Earhart, I'm on vice chair of transportation right. policy. Mm -hmm. Frank Hornstein is chair of uh, transportation finance, and they have worked so very very hard. And I can tell you, it was really hard for us to pass the bill, the omnibus bill that we did because everybody w wants to move much faster right away. And we know, you know, uh, but we couldn't get the support for the financing. Mm -hmm. So eventually we passed what is kind of like a, just doing the basic work that we could knowing that when we come back next time, we uh, and we are going to be doing a lot of going around the state, mm -hmm. you know, Hopefully the deferred understand. projects are going to keep building right. up, right? They're not, the projects so. are not going away, yeah. and uh, w if we want to compete both business-wise, we need to have in infrastructure. And that sometimes what amazes me is 
in many cases, you know, you would think that the chambers and the businesses would, would be out there. And actually, in some of these projects, they are now, at least the local chambers, mm -hmm. are coming out and supporting things. Like uh, one of the bills uh, that we put into, uh, talked about, is called, and I'll change the, uh, all of a sudden I forgot the name of it, but it is where we're talking about certain areas where it really is uh, impacts the commerce in that area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so economic development. Exactly. And you know, arguably Egan is affected by this. We have a lot of warehouses here and a lot of businesses. We have UPS, Coca Cola, other we businesses have, yes. that Thomson Reuters where we're sitting. And the success of those businesses depends on having a good transportation infrastructure. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I mean yeah, we have literally almost every every form of transportation here except maybe boats yeah or, uh, but it as it always does our time is starting to wind, wind down and i do want to hit a couple of issues and give you a moment to mention something here too viking stadium legislature approved 348 million uh, of state backing for the stadium with a total the stadium has a total price tag about 975 million there's been some concern though sandy as you know about shortfall in revenues from electronic gaming what will happen if this revenue continues to fall short of expectations well uh, obviously we're going to have to do a lot more discussion now i didn't stand, sit on any of the committees that dealt with this mm -hmm. this year and we didn't do a lot of conversations about that uh, I know, and I've, from some of the conversations I've heard, I mean, it does sound like what they plat passed last session really wasn't very realistic, or it's not, it's not a popular way mm -hmm. of raising money. So I, I'm thinking we are going to have to go back and revisit that, and that is going to be incredibly difficult. Labor issues. Um, big controversial bill this year allowing unions to attempt to organize child care providers who receive state subsidies and personal care workers who help people with disabilities uh, who are living in their and homes seniors. too. And personal care, say, helping seniors living in their mm -hmm. homes. But isn't it a fact, however, that this new law, it actually doesn't impose a new union on anybody, but it simply provides these workers with the option of whether or not to organize for collective bargaining. Exactly. I mean, it's... It, and you it, supported that. Right. I mean, it gives, there are two steps that have to happen before people for, form a union. And that's all we did is to authorize the process. Okay. So there was just so much information going on about that. It was incredible. And I'm, I'm still getting some, some very... <laughs> I mean, e emails at this point and uh, yeah. on that. But it tent. didn't. It no. didn't immediately it did, create we, a union. The workers did. are still going to have to have an election. Right. They it's, get to decide. Right. Yeah. It is. It's just giving the opening a process. Real quick, twenty seconds, Sandy. Tell us okay. about this. Okay. I just want to mention that you're going to see a lot of uh, extra people in the uh, St. Paul area in the next uh, few Ten days. Seconds. The Midwestern Legislative Conference is meeting in St. Paul July 14th through the 17th, so I'm really excited Sandy about Mason, that. Sandy Mason, thanks for being our guest. It's been my pleasure. It's, this has been such a great year to talk about.